Lucanthum and Vulgare, the Oxide Daisy, sometimes known as Marguerite or the Moon Penny, is a wildflower commonly seen throughout North America, yet it has its origins in Europe, commonly found throughout the continent all the way to as far east as Georgia. Here in North America, it has been so successful that it is found in a variety of landscapes, open meadows, forests with open canopies and among breaks, glades and glens, and far west into rangelands. Farmers and ranches are generally not too happy about oxide daisy as it is considered an invasive. Livestock tend to avoid it so it decreases the value of pasture, and when dairy animals eat it, it changes the flavor of their milk in a way that many persons find to be unpalatable. But for the forager, the oxide daisy is a treasure trove. The plant is easily identified and has a multitude of uses. And what's more, one can find it in North America almost anywhere. I know that at our homestead here in the highlands of Nova Scotia, the oxide daisy is one of the forage harvests that we look forward to the most. It is not difficult to identify the oxide daisy, though it is a perennial with two distinct growth phases, and each has its own unique foraging applications. We'll take a look at the identifying traits, and then look at how to use the oxide daisy. Later in its growth, the oxide daisy is typically easy to spot. That is, when it's putting up stems and flowers, so we'll take a look at that phase first, then come back to the earlier stage of growth. Its stems and flower heads emerge from a creeping, fibrous underground rhizome that will produce stems and flowers in large clusters. Typically, if you find one, you'll find dozens but it is not at all uncommon to come across meadows and hillsides with thousands, even tens of thousands in them. And as noted earlier, the oxide daisy is happy to grow almost anywhere that it can get sunlight, even in breaks of open canopy forest. The oxide daisy is in the Asteraceae family, and each flower head is composed of 20 to 30 ray florets, what we think of as the white petals surrounding the blossom. Each white ray floret has distinctive shallow notches, the profuse vertical stems that yield flowers are sometimes branched but typically yield only one flower per stem, and the flower heads themselves are one to three inches broad. The vertical stems emerge from prostrate basal stems, and the plant can easily send out new roots, if conditions are right, enabling the oxide daisy to spread quite easily. Within the ray florets are a cluster of tiny yellow blossoms. They might look like the center of a single flower to the naked eye, but if you examine them under a 10 power loop, you can see that each is a discrete flower in its own right. They are insect pollinated and important sources of pollen for wasps, beetles, and many other insects, especially in late spring when they first emerge, because here in the north, there aren't too many other things blossoming at that time. So the flower heads consist of 20 to 30 white ray florets, and central clusters of a huge number of almost microscopic flowers. The stems beneath those flowers are glabrous or hairless toward the top, become hairy as they work their way down, and are moderately hairy toward the bottom. The stems also have flat outer planes, eight or more, and if you cut one in half, there is a white pith in the center. Early during the stem's growth, there are numerous leaves all around the stem. The leaves may be under an inch near the top and several inches long near the base. As the plant matures and the stems lengthen, the leaves become more scattered along the stem, to the point that may barely seem to be there at all. The leaves themselves are long but deeply lobed, so that it might look almost like they have little fingers coming off of them. Before the flower heads open, they are compacted into tightly bound buds that are roughly spherical, but flattened toward the top and a bit on the bottom. They are surrounded by a ring of green bracts that binds the flower head tightly and protects it. Some have rounded tips, some pointed, and they have a distinct black outline around them that gives the flower head a distinct appearance as if the outline of the bracts has been drawn in with a black ink pen. While most people might recognize the oxide daisy from its later stage of growth, earlier in spring it emerges from a basal rosette that is less noticeable, and in fact looks so different that many persons might not recognize the rosette as having anything to do with the oxide daisy at all. But the rosettes, like the oxide daisy itself, are quite distinct, and with a bit of practice one can easily come to recognize they are the precursors of the oxide daisy, and this is important because this is one of the better parts to forage. These rosettes will have larger, broader leaves that are a glossy dark green with paler veins. The leaves themselves are typically spoon-shaped, though not so deeply lobed as the later leaves that emerge up and down the stems. The rosettes may be quite sparse, consisting of only a few almost unnoticeable leaves in a rough circle, or, as shown here, they can be enormous, easily a couple feet in diameter, and rising as much as a foot. So why would this plant, shunned by farmers and ranchers and disliked by much livestock, be such a valuable forage crop? Because every part above the roots is useful and nutritious. 
Not to mention tasty. Did I say it was also very tasty? It even has some incredible uses as an herb for flavoring foods. The young flower heads, when they are still tightly bound, make excellent capers. Just pickle them using any caper recipe. As the stems mature, the sparse small leaves that grow up and down it gain a bitter flavor and come to resemble in taste carrot or tarragon or both. I've had oxide daisy stem leaves that taste entirely like tarragon and others that taste entirely like carrot. Most taste like a melange, but to find out what yours tastes like, you'll just have to sample them yourself. You never can tell. One plant will give you tarragon, the next will give you carrot. However, those that make a tarragon substitute are excellent and you can dry them and use them just like normal tarragon. True tarragon does not grow well in the climate around our homestead, so this makes an important local substitute. However, I think it's the basil rosettes that are the true gem of the oxeye daisy. The basil rosette leaves are tender, crispy, have no bitterness, and have a pleasant, mildly herbal flavor. From spring well into midsummer, I harvest these simply by grasping a clump and cutting the base of it with a knife. And we use these as fresh salad long before the gardens are giving us any produce. And because the oxide daisy is ubiquitous and indeed abundant, these often become forage foods during hikes and camping, when I pluck them up to make field salads or put them on sandwiches. Oxide daisies are a very successful Asteraceae family plant and reproduce readily from their fibrous rootstocks and from their flower heads. Indeed, a single plant can make as much as 26,000 seeds that have no requisite dormancy period and root and germinate readily. The seeds, in fact, can survive up to 40 years, giving them ample time to find good growing conditions. Because of this, and because the oxide daisy is widely considered an invasive, you can harvest this one all you want and enjoy it anytime you can find it. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist program is committed to the reliable coverage of all matter of topics relating to natural science. From ecology and conservation, to the nature of the universe beyond our Earth, and making that information practical with solid advice on living well with the natural world. If you appreciate the program, please take a moment to subscribe. Subscribing costs nothing and never will, but it sure helps a lot.